Good afternoon, and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center Designing for Pedestrian Safety webinar series. Today is the third webinar of this APAR series. Today's webinar is entitled Treatments at Unsignalized Pedestrian Crossings with Charlie Zagier, PBIC Director. During this presentation, we will also have Peter Un, Federal Highway Administration Resource Center Safety Engineer, joining us to answer questions. My name is Davian Anderson, and I am the PBIC Communications Coordinator. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I'd first like to say hello to today's first speaker to make sure he is ready and everyone can hear him. Charlie, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Uh, before we get started with today's webinar, I want to go over a few administrative details and the functionality of the webinar software. If for some reason your computer or web browser freezes during the webinar, please reload the website and log back into the program. You'll be able to rejoin the session. Please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar. We do expect a large number of attendees on this call, so by muting your audio, it helps us to cut down on confusion and background noise. As an attendee, you do have a control box in the upper right-hand corner of your screen that collapses and expands by clicking the double arrows. Though you won't be able to speak, you will have the ability to ask questions by entering them in the question box. If you have a problem during the webinar, you may enter it here. I'll monitor these questions and respond if I'm able. Questions pertaining to the presentation may be asked at any time in the question box, but will not be addressed until the end of the program, when we have a built-in about 20 minutes for a discussion period. Please feel free to ask those questions as we go along, and we'll get to them after the presentation. Also, when you exit the webinar, also when you exit the webinar, there's a brief survey that will pop up. We will be very much appreciate your feedback on our performance. Following today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up email. This email will be sent one to two days after the presentation and will include a link to download a printable certificate of attendance for 1.5 hours of instruction. If there are multiple attendees at your site, please forward this link to the other participants so that we can download so that you can download and print the certificate. Um, let me first tell you a little bit about today's speaker, Charlie Zagier. Uh, Charlie is the director of the PBIC, and he has taught courses on pedestrian and roadway safety throughout the U.S. over the past 25 years. He has been principal investigator and primary report author on numerous federal studies and guides, including the Federal Highway Administration Guide, How to Develop a Pedestrian Safety Action Plan, and the NC. HRP report, a guide for reducing collisions involving pedestrians, both of which can be found in the PBIC online library. And Charlie, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and pass the controls to you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, Charlie, we can hear you now. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, Peter Un is also on the line. And Peter, do you want to uh, tell a little bit about your background and experience? Sure. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, I'm with Federal Highways uh, Resource Center, Safety and Design Technical Service Team. Been with uh, the agency and this team approximately about 12 years, and I've uh, been doing the pedestrian safety team with uh, Charlie and some others uh, for approximately five, six years. So um, I'll keep it short there. Um, basically, what we want to do is cover a couple different uh, topics today. First, we're going to talk about some of the basic crossing principles. What do we need to understand about pedestrian crossings? Uh, and how they interact, interact with motor vehicles. Uh, uh, and then we're going to get into more of the countermeasure aspects of what we can do to improve safety for pedestrians crossing at unsignalized locations. Okay, so one of the questions um, is why do pedestrians cross the street to begin with? And there are many reasons, and uh, whether it's kids walking to school or uh, adults walking to work or walking to the store, but whatever the reasons, uh, as safety professionals, we need to be uh, accommodating for pedestrians and providing safe crossings uh, for them to get across the street. Some agencies we talk to will uh, simply say, well, we don't want pedestrians to cross here. So then that's using an excuse to do nothing for pedestrians. And unfortunately, that doesn't work. That doesn't solve the problem. So uh, pedestrians are still going to cross. And uh, we just need to be aware of pedestrian behavior and try to accommodate it uh, within uh, the extent uh, practical. 
we know that pedestrians really shouldn't have to run across the street like this. You know, here are two young girls trying to get across, and it's really not even that wide compared to some of the arterial streets we see out there. Uh, but you can see this kind of behavior uh, is likely to lead to uh, crashes. And here they are running with their backs to traffic. Okay, and uh, some people say, well, ideally we'd like to have pedestrians cross at a location with positive control, traffic signals. And while that may be appropriate, certainly at busy intersections or busy uh, crossings, it's not always the best solution. Because first of all, we cannot provide traffic signals everywhere, every 10 feet along our highways. Uh, that would be utter chaos. Traffic would uh, slow to a stop. And secondly, we know that many of our high pedestrian crash locations uh, and high vehicle vehicle crash locations do occur at signalized uh, crossings. So signals certainly have their place, and they're certainly appropriate in some conditions, but they're not the magic solution everywhere. We know motorists still can run red lights. Uh, often motorists fail to yield to pedestrians when turning on a green, and, and other problems can occur. And we know that pedestrians are not, uh, these pedestrians are not criminals, um, that here we have provided uh, parking on the right side of the street, and we have the stores on the left side, so people are going to naturally you know, park in the parking areas and then cross the street, often where it's uh, most convenient or the shortest distance. And it may not always be possible for pedestrians to walk uh, a block or two or three down to the signal to cross, um, plus knowing that that's not necessarily going to be a, an ideal location to cross anyway. So, uh, and we also don't know, you know whether there's a sidewalk on the right side for them to walk to get to the signal. So we just need to be thinking about uh, pedestrian needs, also, pedestrian behavior. We know that some pedestrians use crosswalks and others tend not to. We know, for example, from the research that senior pedestrians, older pedestrians, are more likely to uh, choose to go cross in the marked crosswalks and to go walk to the signals to cross, uh, even though they you know, do have uh, you know, some challenges sometimes to get to these crossings. So let's look at a few basic principles. Uh, first of all, pedestrians want and need to cross the street safely. Hopefully we can all agree to that. Secondly, drivers need to understand pedestrians' intent. And we often see crashes involving pedestrians at unsignalized crossings where the pedestrian just doesn't know what the motorist is going to do and vice versa. There was a collision a few years ago I learned about in the state of Maine where a young boy was struck by a pickup truck driver crossing at an unsignalized crosswalk. Luckily, the boy wasn't hurt too badly. He did have uh, a broken arm. And uh, when the officer asked the boy, uh, why did you step into the street in front of that truck? Didn't you see the, the, the truck coming? And the boy said, yes, I saw the driver. I saw that he saw me, so I assumed he was going to stop for me. But they asked the driver, why did you hit the boy? Didn't you see him crossing in the crosswalk? And the driver said, yes, I looked down, saw the boy, saw that he saw me, and I assumed he would wait for me. So here's an example of uh, just misunderstanding about certainly the, the rules of the road at a legal crossing, the driver should have yielded the pedestrian, and certainly the, the pedestrian assumed that that uh, would be the case. Another principle, we need to try to keep our crossings short. Uh, we know that uh, for long crossings, pedestrians <coughs> are in the road <coughs> excuse me, for a long time, and that can lead to, uh, to crashes. We also know that that can result in increased motorist and pedestrian delay. And uh, uh, it can decrease the ability of slower pedestrians like this lady here to really be able to, to cross safely. There was an uh, older lady in Los Angeles uh, that uh, didn't have enough time to get across the street during the walk signal a couple years ago. There's a newspaper article where there was an officer on the scene. And because she was delayed in finishing her crossing, Vehicles got the green light and had to wait for her. So the officer ran over, gave her a ticket for uh, slowing up the intersection. So her crime was that she didn't walk fast enough to, uh, to meet the uh, signal timing. So this is not the kind of environment we want to create. The next issue is the, um, uh, relates to speed. There are three different ways that high vehicle speeds can increase the likelihood of pedestrian collisions. When we talk about the uh, reduced field of vision, uh, the reduction in the motorist's ability to react in time to avoid the crash, 
and then increased crash severity at higher speeds. Okay, at a lower speed um, roadway like this, drivers have a wider field of vision and are much more able to see pedestrians crossing the street that may be coming from the left or the right. As that speed increases, uh, you can see the field of vision decreasing, again, at higher speed, and finally at this higher speed. And so basically drivers are more likely to look at the horizon and less likely to be able to even notice pedestrians that may be crossing from their left or right. Oftentimes we see collision reports where the officer strike, I mean, the uh, driver hits a pedestrian and then gives a statement to the police, well, the pedestrian came out of nowhere. Well, the pedestrian didn't come out of nowhere. They, the driver just wasn't watching and was really fixing their, their eyes on the horizon ahead. And this is often what we, uh, we see for the higher speed roadways. If you look at this graph, many of you are familiar with the relationship between vehicle speed and stopping distance. So if you look at the x-axis there, that's a combination of uh, reaction distance. In other words, what is the distance a driver travels uh, uh, in order for him to perceive and hit the brake? So we call that reaction distance. And we often assume about a second and a half or, or so for a driver from the time they see a pedestrian or something in the roadway ahead until they can actually you know, hit the brake. And then the other component there is the braking distance, you know, how long it actually takes a motorist <clears throat> to come to a complete stop after they've hit the brake. So if you look at the relationship between speed and stopping distance, you can see that at slow speeds, around 10 miles an hour, a motorist can stop in about 50 feet, whereas when they're going as fast as 40, it may take you know, more than 300 feet to stop. Okay, the other factor with speed uh, relates to the probability of death uh, from a pedestrian that's struck by a motorist. And you can see, uh, based on research from Europe a few years ago, if a motorist is traveling 40 miles an hour when they strike a pedestrian, there's about an 85% chance that pedestrian will die. If we can do something with the street design to get the speeds down to 30, that reduces the chance of death down to about 45% and further down to about 15% if we can get the speeds down to around 20. Okay, now there are ways to slow down speeds, and many of you know about traffic calming measures. Um, this talks about uh, curb extensions that can help slow traffic speeds. Uh, I will add, though, that uh, generally things like curb extensions work better in terms of speed reduction if they're used in kind of a sequence or a series along a corridor. In other words, if you just have curb extensions at one intersection, it's less likely to really reduce the overall speeds along that route. So usually you have to sort of make a more dramatic series of improvements uh, so that the effective width of the street is reduced in order to get the speeds down effectively. Principle five says pedestrians will cross where it's most convenient. And again, you know, uh, uh, humans will do what they, they feel is appropriate for them. People often, you know, want to, uh, uh, use the, the shortest distance between two points. And while some pedestrians will go out of their way by several hundred feet to cross, most of us won't. Most of us will cross uh, uh, where it's, it's quickest to get across the street. Uh, now, as the volumes get higher, then that starts to complicate things. But just something to keep in mind as we're designing for unsignalized crossings. Okay, now the issue of intersection versus mid-block uh, is a little bit complicated because many of us have been taught from the time we were young to go and cross at the intersection, that that was safer. And some of the, the research that's been done, some of the research we've done, actually indicates that uh, whether a pedestrian is crossing at a mid-block mid or intersection uh, doesn't make a significant difference uh, when you take into account other more important factors like uh, the number of lanes, the vehicle speed, traffic volume, sight distance and things like that. So it really depends on other factors. Okay, uh, Peter, could you just say a little bit about uh, some of the new federal uh, uh, discussion, particularly by the Secretary of Transportation, about the need for us to provide for pedestrians? Yeah, Charlie, um, recently, actually, back in March 11th of 2010, Secretary LaHood actually put out a, uh, a memo 
Um, it's the United States Department of Transportation policy statement on bicycle and pedestrian accommodation regulations and recommendations. And this can be found on the web. But one of the um, important things that he stated in this memo was it said considering walking and bicycling as equal modes with other transportation modes, which is really huge, um, and supports pedestrians and bikes. Um, and just something else to highlight, it says walking and bicycling should not be an afterthought in roadway design. So um, this memo uh, was put signed on uh, March 11, 2010, and it was announced on March 15th. Uh, you can go ahead and Google it on the web. Um, it's on the DOT website if you need more information. Actually, I'll put in the link um, over in the chat pod for Damien to put out. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Peter. Okay, so now let's look at some of the different countermeasures that are available for pedestrians. Uh, to really reduce crash risk. We can talk about some of these crosswalks, illumination, sign striping, raised median islands, uh, signals, and then grade separation. Okay, what we don't want to do is uh, end up having to uh, make our citizens think they have to use uh, these climbing bars, monkey bars, in order to get across streets safely. Uh, so often our the public realizes some of the the difficulties of getting across the street, and so you see these kinds of cartoons in, in different newspapers. Uh, but let's talk first about, you know, what are uh, crosswalks, why are they used, when should they be used, and what are some of the issues surrounding them? Uh, we know that, uh, you know, the crosswalks are provided for two basic reasons. Number one, to indicate to pedestrians where uh, it's a preferred crossing location, and two, to indicate to drivers where they might be expecting pedestrians to cross. And then the next question we have is, uh, so how should we determine where to mark a crosswalk uh, as engineers and planners? So I'm going to ask Peter to say a little bit about what's in the uh, most recent MUTCD, uh, Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the 2009 version. Sure, Charlie. Um, and thanks. Uh, you're going to go into the study a little more here, but uh, based upon the, the latest research with regards to marked in uh, a marked crosswalk, the 2009 METCD picked up um, this information and they incorporated it into uh, the new METCD. So um, you know, it provides uh, crosswalk markings, provide the guidance for pedestrians who are crossing, as you stated, um, and for the uh, driver as well. But um, did you want me to get into a little more about the actual METCD wording, or I can maybe provide that link as well? It's in chapter, um, it's in chapter uh, section 3B.118 under crosswalk markings as far as the research to the study. Yeah, that, that's fine. And many of the engineers out there uh, have seen the new METCD. Okay. Okay, so if you see now the, the next photograph that says, uh, determine where to mark a crosswalk. And uh, certainly we need to consider the origins and destinations uh, of pedestrians. You can see in this case, we have apartment buildings on the left. We have uh, stores and bus stops on the right. And so this would be a, a logical place to put a uh, marked crosswalk. And you can see they provided a raised meeting island here as well. OK, and, and I might add that there are many locations that are not suitable for just a marked crosswalk alone. And here are some of the factors, examples. OK, this location is not good to put a marked crosswalk because you know, there's really no one location here where pedestrians would likely cross. Lots of uh, you know, fast food restaurants and, and different businesses, uh, service stations, et cetera, along this uh, arterial street. So that it wouldn't make sense to just put in a crosswalk. Here's another example where the sight distance is very limited uh, around a horizontal curve. So even though they have a marked crosswalk here with a sign, uh, that would really not be uh, an ideal location. And drivers wouldn't have enough uh, sight distance or warning uh, ahead of time necessarily to, uh, uh, to yield to pedestrians. OK, there are many lo locations, however, that are suitable for adding crosswalks. Here's a, here's a two-lane, low-speed, uh, looks like low-volume roadway. And here they have a crosswalk that connects uh, the crossing to a bus stop on each side of the street. And you can see that when the bus pulls up in each direction, that the bus would uh, uh, pull up uh, you know, in advance of the crosswalk. 
So pedestrians would get off the bus and then cro cross behind the bus, which would give much better sight distance between the pedestrians uh, and the oncoming vehicles. Here's another suitable location for a marked crosswalk. Uh, it is uh, uh, actually near the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. Uh, they actually have a very wide marked crosswalk, lots of pedestrians there, uh, low speed, narrow two-lane road, and it would be a place where motorists would uh, very likely be expecting pedestrians and then very likely uh, a yield to them uh, in a crossing like this. Okay, the next question is, but do marked crosswalks increase safety or uh, encourage people to cross without looking? So I'm going to say a little bit about a study we did a few years ago for Federal Highway Administration where we really tried to address the question, you know, is it safer to mark crosswalks or not mark them at unsignalized or uncontrolled locations? And many of you know there had been some research done starting in the 1970s uh, by Bruce Herms in San Diego, for example, uh, that said that having a marked crosswalk had an increased risk uh, of pedestrian crashes compared to an unmarked crosswalk. And for years after that, many cities in the U.S. simply wouldn't put in marked crosswalks unless there was a traffic signal there or maybe unless it was in a school zone. And so essentially, uh, when we did our study, we really wanted to look at this issue and, and use data from cities uh, around the U.S. So we ended up using around 2,000 uh, crosswalk locations in 30 U.S. cities. We collected five years of pedestrian crash data. We collected uh, pedestrian volume, traffic volume number of lanes, uh, speed limit, and other roadway factors. And then our statistical analysis, uh, Poisson modeling, to try to find out, you know, when you account for all these different important factors that affect pedestrian crashes, what is the effect of having that crosswalk marking uh, after you account for all the other factors? And what this study, this slide shows, is the results of the study that said essentially if you're on a two-lane road, it makes no difference in pedestrian crash risk, whether it's a marked crosswalk or not. If you're on a multi-lane road, roads with three or more lanes, um, as long as the traffic volume is less than 12,000 vehicles a day, there's no significant difference between marked and unmarked. However, the problems can come in when you have a multi-lane road combined with traffic volume of about 12,000 or more vehicles a day without a median or with more than 15,000 vehicles a day with a median. And what happens in those higher volume situations is pedestrian crash risk increases where you have marked crosswalks compared to unmarked. Okay, now, so that's a little bit uh, counterintuitive to what we might have thought, uh, you know, for those that thought, well, gee, a crosswalk is a pedestrian measure. It must make it safer for pedestrians. But that really is not the case, at least marked crosswalks alone, I have this kind of problem, and we're going to talk about some of the reasons. First of all, I'll also mention that we found as part of a study that on these multi-lane roads, having a raised median reduces pedestrian crash risk by about 40 percent. So this is something that was really a valuable outcome of the study. The other thing we found, and actually is one of the reasons why we have a higher crash risk in these um, high-volume multi-lane um, crosswalks, is because the older pedestrian, we found, is at greater risk of being strike, struck crossing the street to begin with, number one. And number two, it's the older pedestrians that also tend to go to the marked crosswalks to cross. So that is one of the reasons why the crash risk is higher for pedestrians in marked versus unmarked crosswalks for these high, higher volume multi-lane roads. We also had a study done uh, at the same time of ours to look and see why this was happening. Uh, and they looked at pedestrian behavior and driver behavior. They did not find that pedestrians were being more careless or using less caution in the marked crosswalks, um, uh, which was uh, kind of an interesting finding, at least on the two- and three-lane roads. But we're going to look at some other issues in just a minute. I'm going to give you the second reason in a minute why the marked crosswalks had more crashes and what we can do about it. And as I said, the uh, <clears throat> higher volume ro roads with a greater number of lanes were the ones that had the most pedestrian crash risk and the ones of, of most concern uh, for pedestrians in general. And here's the other reason. The, the main reason why uh, crashes increase in the marked crosswalks and multi-lane roads, they're high volume, is because we had a, a number of these what we call multiple threat crashes. 
And that is, when there is a marked crosswalk, uh, there's more likelihood that the first vehicle, this dark vehicle in the right lane, in the curb lane, will stop for the pedestrian. And then that sets up the pedestrian to assume it's safe to cross. The pedestrian steps in front of the first vehicle in the path of the, the second oncoming motorist that may not see the pedestrian until it's too late. So you have what we call a multiple threat crash. And as I said, this is uh, initiated by the first vehicle that stops right at the crosswalk uh, to begin with. OK, so essentially our recommendations were that it's OK to mark a crosswalk on two-lane roads or the low-volume multi-lane. But on the higher-volume multi-lane, we need to do more than just mark crosswalks alone to help pedestrians get across the street. OK, so uh, Peter, do you want to say just a, a word or two about this? This is uh, the actual wording uh, in the new METCD that, that came about uh, as a direct result of our FHWA study. Sure. Um, thanks. And sorry, Charlie, I think I jumped the gun a little bit there on the earlier slides where That's okay. um, really on the uh, crosswalk markings, um, where to mark them. You know, you really should be doing studies uh, with regards to the locations and such. But based upon that, um, and the recommendations are in the new 2009 METCD, but with regards to the uncontrolled uh, crossings, as you stated, um, and these are at speeds um, under 40 miles per hour, uh, the METCD took the language based upon the ADTs and with regards to medians and the number of lanes and the speeds and uh, the language there, as you can uh, see. Um, and really, the key is the new marked crosswalks alone, right? Um, that you don't want to yes. just put crosswalks out there by themselves. You do want to use them in conjunction with other countermeasures that you're going to be bringing up. And it recognizes that just marked crosswalks alone um, under these type of conditions should not be done. Um, so it's really the the greatest and latest uh, with regards to how to uh, agencies should be looking at for guidance on how to do their uh, crosswalk markings um, inventories. Uh, and I should just note, uh, just the other day, um, I was given an email uh, with regards to the state. Uh, there was, I won't name the state, but there was a lawsuit. And um, based upon this lawsuit, uh, a person was struck. And um, well, based upon this lawsuit, a person was walking in, on a multi-lane roadway. And they knew that there was a history with regards to um, crashes at this location. And the agency said all that they were going to do was put in marked crosswalks and nothing else. And um, because of that negligence, uh, without putting other types of uh, countermeasures, um, it was a $12 million hit uh, to the agency. And so really having uh, taken a look at the study and doing um, probably an inventory of all your crosswalks and uh, um, understanding what the, the latest uh, with regards to the guidance should be, um, the agency should, should be looking at that. Yeah, so another good reason why we should uh, pay close attention to the uh, MUTCD and, and AASHTO guidelines, right, Peter? Okay, That's let's correct. look at, uh, at situations that, you know, where it's appropriate to put in marked crosswalks uh, and where you may need more treatments. You know, what are some of these other treatments and measures that may be appropriate? And we're going to talk about some of these uh, issues, the visibility, illumination, signing, uh, uh, advanced top lines, raised medians, curb extensions, and signals were warranted. OK, one of the key quotes from our study basically then got into the issue of saying that, um, you know, when considering mark crosswalks, the question shouldn't just be, you know, should I mark it or not? He goes on to say that when we're providing for pedestrian crossings, we really need to ask the question, you know, how can we get pedestrians safely across the street? So, that, and that may encompass many of the kinds of treatments that are mentioned in the second bullet here. You know, looking at things like curb extensions and raised crossing islands, uh, roadway narrowing, improved overhead lighting, traffic calming, et cetera. Okay, and, and the one analogy that some of you heard me give is, uh, you know, sometimes we'll go to a place and the uh, engineer raises his hand and say, well, if marked crosswalks don't make us safer, why don't I just go take out all the marked crosswalks and be done with it? And we say, well, you tell me why that isn't a good solution. And, and obviously, the, the answer is because it doesn't really help pedestrians get across the street. And the example I give is if, you know, if, uh, if I had a broken arm and went into the doctor and said, doctor, I want some aspirin for my broken arm, you know, the doctor would say, well, the aspirin's not going to cure your arm. If the doctor just said, so go home, have a nice day, and uh, you know, you, you'll be fine. Well, you know, the doctor hadn't helped that patient. You know, the, the broken arm is still there, and, and a better doctor would say, well, 
you need more substantial treatment than aspirin alone. And that doctor will say, well, I need to set the bone, put a cast on the arm, and then give you the aspirin or the painkiller. In other words, a more substantial combination of, of treatments uh, to really heal the broken arm. And that's what we really have to be thinking about. And when we have a wide, high-speed, high-volume arterial street, that's essentially a broken highway for pedestrians. They can't get across safely. They have a problem. And the risks are really high for pedestrians. So as... Um, as public servants, as engineers and planners, we really need to be thinking about, you know, what are the right solutions, the best solutions? It's going to cost more money, but, but yet, you know, having a marked crosswalk not only won't fix it, but if you just do that and nothing else, you know, could increase the risk. So for situations where you do have a marked crosswalk with or without other treatments, you know, we need to make sure that the crosswalk is visible to drivers. Okay, so many of you, if I ask you, you know, can the pedestrian see this crosswalk, you'll say, sure. And then if I said, do you think the motorist, oncoming motorists from the left or right can see it? The answer is no. And, and this is the driver's viewpoint of that crosswalk as they approach uh, from either direction. It's virtually invisible to the driver. So why have a crosswalk out there, you know, if a driver can't see it? So, you know, we're not going to get into a lot of detail here, but there are different uh, crosswalk types. The parallel line, which can be okay. Many agencies use them. They're the most common. Uh, but the more visible crosswalks are the continental style, like you see in the middle, uh, or the uh, ladder type. And research has shown that certainly drivers can see these crosswalks from much, much further away than they can the parallel line. Um, here's an example of a really well-marked crossing. The ladder design, very visible to the dri driver as well as the pedestrian. Here's an example of uh, where the agency has actually staggered the uh, wheel paths so that the uh, wheels don't run over the, the paint. And agencies like Orlando, Florida have gone to more of this pattern as a standard practice, and they, they claim it actually saves them, them money in the long run in terms of uh, not having to keep re, uh, replacing the parallel line uh, markings that get uh, worn away fairly quickly. Okay, and here is sort of a driver's view of what the uh, a staggered ladder would look like of the continental style from uh, several hundred feet away. You can really see that crosswalk and, and, and also there's a supplemental signing, the uh, school crossing uh, pavement marking. Uh, so it's, it's really a lot uh, better marked for drivers. Now nighttime presents a lot of risk issues for pedestrians. Uh, we know that the risk for a pedestrian crash is much greater at night than during the day for obvious reasons. Uh, we know from some of the, the NHTSA research uh, from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that if a pedestrian is wearing even a white shirt uh, walking at night crossing the street or walking along the roadway, that a motorist with low beams can only see that pedestrian and tell it's a pedestrian when they're less than about 200 feet away. And if a pedestrian is wearing dark clothing, uh, a dark shirt or, or, or blue clothing, a motorist cannot see that pedestrian and identify him as a person until the driver is only about 40 to 60 feet away. And that's certainly not enough time for a driver to, uh, you know, to recognize a pedestrian and hit their brakes and stop before striking the pedestrian. So, so these are issues many pedestrians don't realize that. They assume that because they can see the oncoming headlights of the motorist, that the motorist can see them just as well. But that's not the case. So what can we do from the roadway standpoint in terms of improving lighting for pedestrian crossings? Um, I'm going to show you a few illustrations of uh, lighting uh, examples that traditionally this is what we would do, that you know, we would put the lighting over the crosswalk. Uh, we do know that in well-lit uh, locations that uh, having overhead lighting can reduce pedestrian crashes. In fact, some of the uh, uh, crash reductions uh, range from about 42% of uh, pedestrian crashes at night that are prevented uh, up to about 54% at intersections. And while we we're showing you what we call crash reduction factors, sort of the new terminology now is crash modification factors. So that, that's sort of a, uh, that would be 1 minus you know, 0.2 or 1 minus 0.5. But still, you get the picture. About half of pedestrian uh, crashes can be reduced uh, at night if proper illumination is used. Now, there's a fairly new study, actually a couple years ago, that was done by a gentleman, Professor Gibbons at Virginia Tech. And he really was able to get in and uh, do some analysis of the types of uh, lighting that best uh, uh, benefit pedestrians at mid-block locations. 
And what he found is that sort of the design on the right, where you have the overhead lighting on one side of the crosswalk or the other, really uh, casts more light on the pedestrian and is much, makes them much more visible to the oncoming driver compared to the traditional uh, uh, lighting layout that you see on the left. Because having the lighting overhead really doesn't illuminate the pedestrian uh, to the driver very well. So you can see some examples here of the uh, traditional lighting that we see on the left, uh, and then some of the newer designs you see on the right and on the bottom. So this is something that is recommended. And if any of you want this report, uh, Davey, and I guess we can put this uh, on the website too, where people can can download it, because on the FHA website. Peter, you want to say anything more about the lighting issue? Um, no, I'll provide the link for them so that they can go ahead and get access to that. Okay, and getting into some of the other signing issues now, uh, you can see the signing on the uh, upper left, which is the old way of doing it. We, they would have the pedestrian and the crosswalk marking. Research showed that very few drivers understood what that meant, that that was intended to mean uh, you know, the signing at the crosswalk itself. And now we use sort of the, the uh, signing uh, sequence on the lower left with the pedestrian uh, warning sign and the down arrow. And then you see in the, on the right sort of the advanced pedestrian warning uh, crossing the head sign. Okay, now one of the other signs that's actually been around the MUTCD since the 2003 version, uh, especially the one on the left that says state law yield to pedestrians within crosswalk. And these in-street pedestrian signs, some people call them the knockdown sign, unfortunately, because they often get knocked down. But these are uh, available to be used at the engineer uh, or planner's judgment at pedestrian crossings uh, where there's not a signal. And uh, this one happens to be placed uh, on a raised median island, so it can be seen by motorists. And uh, you use the sign on the left in a state that, that has what we call the yield law, that's where the law states motors must yield to pedestrians in crosswalk versus the sign on the right uh, in states that say uh, motors must stop for pedestrians in crosswalk. But essentially, one or, uh, or the other of those signs uh, can be used um, at pedestrian crossings like this. And we've actually done some research on these and found that motors yielding behavior does increase. We evaluated about six, six of these in New York State at uh, two-lane or three-lane uh, crossings on lower speed downtown locations. And so an increase from about 30% up to about 60% of motorists were yielding to uh, uh, pedestrians after the signs were put in. But still, you know, my question is, you know, what about those 40% of motorists that are still not yielding? You know, is that going to cause a potential pedestrian crash risk? So anyway, it's just some, it is one option, but uh, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this on higher speed multi-lane uh, roadways with high volumes. Uh, we just don't know enough about these signs in terms of where they're effective or not effective. There is sort of a, a higher level device uh, that's not currently in the uh, 2009 MUTCD, but it has gotten tentative approval by the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. It's called the Rectangular Rapid Flash uh, LED Beacon. And uh, this is essentially uh, a device that has a pedestrian warning sign with a down arrow at the crosswalk and kind of a, an unusual or stutter flash, we call it, sort of similar to the flashing light on the top of a police car. Um, and basically, uh, this irregular flash does seem to get the driver's attention more so than so, sort of a, the old-fashioned uh, uh, flashing yellow ball. We call it also the wigwag flash. And some of the research done by Dr. Van Houten in Florida has found that yielding rates uh, are as high as about 80 to 90 percent for motorists uh, yielding to pedestrians where they install this type of RRFB, they call it, uh, rapid, uh, rectangular rapid flash beacon. So this is another option that's available to you. Uh, you would have to uh, check with FHWA, but they are granting pretty much blanket approval for uh, use of this device, even though it's not formally in the MTCD. Hey, Charlie, a uh, quick note uh, yeah, with regards to if people want to um, see a video of that and if they have access to YouTube uh, uh, on their computers, they can type in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, right there in your neck of the woods, and uh, just type in Wilmington, North Carolina, rectangular rapid flash beacon, they can see a video of that. <clears throat> okay, thank you. thank you, Peter. Yeah, so basically uh, uh, it has been uh, used by a number of agencies, um, and you can see 
how it is uh, installed here that essentially when it is used, you need to make sure that on a divided roadway that you have a device in the median like this as well as on the right side of the road, especially on a multi-lane approach so the driver in, in one lane uh, doesn't have their view blocked by the vehicle in the other lane. So they can see one or the other of these sides. Of course, you would want to have, uh, you know, well-marked crosswalks, possibly uh, illumination, and the advanced warning sign as well. Now, what they've also done is they've used the uh, advanced yield line, which we're going to talk about next in conjunction with these uh, rapid flash beacons. And sometimes people say, well, we have a, a multi-lane road. Uh, we need to have multi-lanes to handle the traffic volume. So what can we do to help reduce this multiple threat crash? And so the answer is, well, consider uh, the advanced yield lines or advanced stop lines. That we know that, as we saw before, where you do have this multiple threat crash where the first vehicle stops on the crosswalk, that blocks the view of the oncoming vehicle from the pedestrian. So if we can really look at this kind of scenario where we have a uh, pulled back or advanced stop line or yield line that's located between 20 and 50 feet on the approach to the crosswalk, uh, then the idea is that car A will stop back of the crosswalk, opening up the sight distance so the driver of car B can then see the pedestrian that's stepping out into the crosswalk, and also the pedestrian is more likely to be able to see the oncoming uh, vehicle B in this case. So either the, the vehicle uh, will have time to stop for the pedestrian or the, and or the pedestrian would have time to avoid the, the collision. Now, when you use either the advanced stop line or the advanced heel line, it's important that you use one of the signs that you see here. Again, the yield signs, yield here to pedestrians in the yield states, or the stop here for pedestrians in the stop states. And the stop sign uh, was adopted in the 2009 MUTCD. Okay, here's a, just an illustration of what that would look like. Now, they have the advanced heel line. I'm not sure if this is quite 50 feet, but you get the idea. They have the yield bars uh, here. Uh, also, in a, this is from a state in Oregon uh, that, that does have the stop law, and they have the uh, stop line in conjunction with the stop here for pedestrian sign. As I said, the MUTCD does recommend uh, and allow for these ad advanced yield lines or stop lines to be placed between 20 and 50 feet setback from the uh, marked crosswalk. Okay. So in summary, on the crosswalk issue, uh, again, it's okay to put in a marked crosswalk on these uh, two-lane roads, lower, lower volume, multi-lane, uh, lower speed roads, um, but you don't have to put a marked crosswalk everywhere. Again, on some of the really low volume local streets, um, there's some question about whether that's justified or not. So that's kind of an agency decision uh, there. But in terms of the higher volume multi-lane, you have to be careful uh, about using marked crosswalks alone. They, we really need to think about what is needed there to help pedestrians get across the street safely. Like, you know, what do you need to fix this broken arm? You need to have a full complement of countermeasures. You know, pick the right treatment for the situation. Okay, for uh, raised median islands, remember we talked about uh, the uh, benefits uh, that you can gain from having raised uh, medians or raised median islands. On multi-lane roads, you can reduce about you know 40 to 45 percent of your pedestrian crashes on multi-lane roads. So that's a huge reduction in crossing crashes, and something to really to keep in mind on your multi-lane roads where pedestrians are having crash problems. All right, let's look at the uh, continuous raised median with the basic principle, you know, being that it breaks up a long, complex crossing into two simple crossings. Pedestrians have a place of refuge; they only have to look to the left, worry about traffic in one direction at a time cross to the median, and then look to the right, make sure it's clear, or make sure motors are yielding before they cross the second half of the street. So we look here at this example. Pedestrians caught in the middle of the road, a flush median, which we found not to benefit pedestrians uh, compared to a raised median. And if we do a little Photoshop and could add a raised median island, and this one has kind of a jag in it, we'll talk about the reason for that in a minute. And now pedestrians have a, a safer crossing. And so Again, looking at the two steps in the crossing. Uh, and here, this example, when they get to the median, some agencies are using kind of a stagger or an angle uh, cut through in the median, so pedestrians will kind of be forced to uh, 
look to the right because their body's turned to the right, and they can hopefully see oncoming traffic uh, and not be as likely to step out into the street in front of the uh, traffic on their right. Okay, uh, pedestrian signals. You know, this is another option if a signal is warranted, um, and we do have some revised uh, language in the new MUTCD warrants. It is now easier to meet the pedestrian volume warrant. Uh, in one of the later sessions, uh, the modules that will be given on pedestrian signals, we'll be getting into some of the details on that. So we're just going to kind of skip over, over it <coughs> for now. But it is easier to meet this warrant uh, to add a traffic signal with pedestrian walk-don't-walk walk signals uh, for pedestrian crossing locations. We recommend that uh, where, the, where you do install a traffic signal with pedestrian heads, that you have what we call a hot button or a quick response, so pedestrians push the button and don't have to wait, you know, long periods of time before the, the light change. Because otherwise, pedestrians just will push the button, won't wait for the light, uh, and then they'll cross uh, against the light, and then traffic will be stopped on a red light where there's no pedestrian waiting. So it's just a kind of a common sense thing. And uh, you can see this is what happened in this case. In the other, the other module we're going to talk on signals, we also talk about things like automatic pedestrian detectors and some of the more advanced signals, uh, things like uh, leading pedestrian intervals and things that can really also further benefit pedestrian safety as signals. Okay, so the, uh, uh, I'm going to show you just sort of a variation of a standard uh, traffic signal for pedestrians. And this is one that's, be, that's being used, uh, in this case, where there's a bus stop kind of in a suburban area along an arterial street. Uh, there aren't pedestrians here very often, but what they've done is they, they have converted uh, this to a two-stage pedestrian crossing, where pedestrian will, uh, pedestrians will push the button, and it will stop traffic on a red light, but only in the direction coming from their left, only in half the street so far. Pedestrians then have the walk signal and can cross to the median while uh, traffic is stopped waiting for them. Then traffic is released. Pedestrians uh, have this gate, and they're sort of forced to, to walk to the right. Uh, and you notice there's an offset crossing. You can see the two different uh, halves of the crosswalk are offset. And so the pedestrians walk down to the uh, next push button. And meanwhile, the traffic has been flowing from, from, the, uh, from the right. Push the button, which stops pedestrians coming from the right in the second direction. Meanwhile, uh, traffic continues from, from the first direction. Pedestrians finish crossing on a, a new walk signal there, and uh, then traffic resumes. So you see what's happened really is we've minimized the delay to pedestrians. You get a hot button for each of the directions. You've limited your delay to motorists. They only have to stop for a short while. Uh, there are some of the details that are required to make this work is you have to have a push button in the median uh, to make sure pedestrians push two different buttons. Uh, and you do need the fencing to sort of channel pedestrians in the median to get to the second uh, push button. Okay, another device that is, I would consider sort of a higher level traffic control device, uh, not quite a full-blown traffic signal uh, with signals in all directions, but this is what we call the, the pedestrian hybrid beacon uh, that's been called the Hawk signal, or the high intensity activated crosswalk. So it's a new device that is approved now in the 2009 MUTCD. And Peter, why don't you say a little bit uh, more about the Hawk or the pedestrian hybrid beacon? Sure. Um, well, I'll talk about the uh, the crash reduction fact, if you like. Um, it is in the uh, what we have uh, CMF Clearinghouse. Um, if people want to access that, www.cmfclearinghouse.org, where they can get the crash modifications for not only the Hawk but others. But for pedestrians, the Hawk has a uh, crash uh, reduction factor of 60%. So pretty, uh, very effective, and um, you know, you'll, I'm sure you'll go through the sequence of how this works. But uh, as far as the, the crash modification factor, or crash reduction factor, I should say, 60%. Um, percent. Okay, thanks, Peter. And uh, what I'm going to show you now is uh, the sequence. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about the sequence of the signal? Okay. Um, oh, by the way, I guess we should mention in the 2009 METCD, this is for mid-block only applications um, in that the picture you might have just saw, it was uh, one of the experiments that uh, experiment, during the experimental process that Tucson was going to, and so they showed it at an intersection. But the application of the Hawk is um, at mid-block only. And what you'll see here is the uh, three-head stage. 
you know, basically three heads. Um, and this sort of to help with the, con you know, not to confuse it with a railroad signal. But it's blanked out um, when there's no, you know, activation. And then as soon as the pedestrian pushes the button, um, it'll go to a flashing yellow. And obviously, we don't have the animation here yet, but uh, so sta flash, stage two is the flashing yellow. That should be flashing. And then on stage three, it goes to a steady yellow. Then stage four, when it goes to the red, is when the pedestrian actually gets the walk. And then once um, the pedestrian clears their half of the roadway, the, uh, the traffic signal engineer can um, time that. And then it goes to a flashing wigwag. And that's when um, the flashing hand would start appearing. During that flashing, that wigwag stage is when um, vehicles can actually start crossing their half of the roadway. Um, and if, if they choose to, it's sort of interesting in some of the videos that I've seen for this is that vehicles will tend to not even move on the wigwag, but they'll wait for uh, the final um, uh, stage to where it goes to blank again, and then they'll proceed. So it's actually a safer um, situation. Um, and also, the reason that we call this a hybrid beacon, uh, they didn't call it a signal, because on a signal, when a, um, uh, all the heads are blanked out, legally you're required to stop. Uh, so it turns into a stop situation. But due to the fact um, they wanted to avoid having everyone change the law with this, they called it a hybrid beacon. Therefore, vehicles don't have to stop on the, the blanked out signal. OK, so thanks, Peter. So think about it. I mean, if we can get this kind of uh, crash reduction, 60% reduction in pedestrian crashes, and it also reduced uh, motor vehicle crashes where they've installed these. Yeah, that's really quite a, uh, a benefit to pedestrian safety. And it is easier to meet the uh, criteria or the warrants for putting in one of these uh, hybrid beacons compared to a, a full-blown uh, traditional traffic signal. OK, uh, now we're going to talk about sort of a countermeasure of last resort. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk about grade separated crossings, uh, overpasses, underpasses. And um, you know, in theory, grade separation means no conflicts, no crashes, right? Well, that's not exactly the way it, it works. Uh, because we know that oftentimes uh, overpasses, for example, are sometimes placed at locations where pedestrians don't use them, or at least many pedestrians don't use them. Uh, in fact, some of the earlier research said that you know, pedestrians had to be able to cross the street quicker by using an uh, overpass or underpass than a crossing street level, or nobody would use it. And you can see that to be the case here, that uh, pedestrians are, uh, in this case, this pedestrian is walking right under the underpass. Um, and this is on a four-lane road. So uh, think about the cost of installing that overpass. Uh, but yet, uh, there's another pedestrian waiting to cross the street level, too. So uh, you can spend a lot of money on grade separation. And we need to be very careful before we uh, commit to doing that, make sure that that is the best solution. Uh, and it's the right solution. Also, in order to um, encourage pedestrians to use an overpass, you may have to use fencing uh, or other barriers, which are ugly. Uh, there are situations where great separation is really about the only treatment, or certainly uh, is appropriate. Uh, like when you uh, connect buildings, uh, people going from one building to another over a street uh, to, pr to mean they don't have to walk down the stairs, cross the street, and back up, uh, pedestrians will use them. Or to connect different kinds of land uses, or crossing freeways, where you know, it really would not be advisable for pedestrians to, to cross a freeway. Uh, or light rail stations, you can see over, over in the lower right. So there are situations where you can justify the expenditure of grade separation. Um, overpasses are very expensive, because you have to meet height requirements, uh, and also requires long ramps. Uh, we also, they have to meet uh, ADA uh, requirements for any new grade separation. So they're really uh, not an inexpensive thing at all. So they're really kind of a last resort. And consider other treatments, uh, at grade treatments, before you invest money in this. Uh, for undercrossings, they also require certain dimensions. Uh, they need to be attractive. And there are some other criteria. A lot of pedestrians won't use the underpasses because uh, they fear for their personal safety. Here's an example here where this pedestrian is clearly intimidated. You can see the look on her face when she comes out of the tunnel. Now, this is kind of uh, some of our worst nightmare. You know, this is not something that's going to be very successfully used by very many pedestrians. Pedestrians would often rather take their chances running across the street than, than crossing here. 
And, and there are situations where underpasses uh, can be uh, applied that are open, airy, attractive, uh, well used. This is on a campus, uh, I think, in Boulder, Colorado, at the University of Colorado. Um, they need to be well lit. Uh, this particular underpass um, has some art, artistic touches to it, uh, and certainly would be much more uh, used and uh, much safer for pedestrians compared to crossing a street level. You can even see uh, uh, you know, the lighting, uh, the natural lighting that comes in here on the skylights. OK, so over, overpasses, underpasses as, as a last resort, um, but sometimes you know, they need to be a consideration, particularly where you have already designed a freeway or a, a wide arterial street, and there's really no other feasible options. So if you, if you look at kind of a summary of all the different treatments we've talked about for pedestrians. Uh, again, these costs are, are rough. Uh, they vary uh, from state to state and by situation. But we know that signing is inexpensive, but its effectiveness is, is really not going to be very great. If you have a serious pedestrian crash problem, you're probably not going to be able to solve it completely with signs and paint alone. As you get into more of the substantial treatments, the raised median islands, um, even the advanced yield lines or advanced soft lines, these are more likely to be able to uh, help to solve a pedestrian crash problem, especially on some of the multi-lane roads. And when you get up into the signals, when we talked about uh, the rectangular rapid flash beacon, the Hawk signal, these are also options that are feasible, allowable now, and, and may be considered uh, versus the overpass, underpass, uh, where you're going to spend a, a, a fortune. The key thing in all of this is that we try to choose the right solution uh, for the given problem and picking the proper location for a given treatment, we, we say, is priceless. Now, um, one of the other basic concepts is you know, right design in, invites right use. So if you have a location where pedestrians are doing all kinds of things that seem to be unwise or you don't understand why they're crossing where they are or why, the way they're crossing, oftentimes it gets back to the design of the roadway uh, and maybe some deficiencies in the crossing itself. So are there things that can, we can really do to go out to the site to really watch pedestrians and traffic, look at the conflicts, look at the crash reports, try to figure out why crashes are happening, and then can, you, you have a whole uh, toolbox of countermeasures that, that you can consider for you know, what are the right treatments to solve the kind of problem you're having. So, and, and, I, and I have to always um, add that while many of these treatments can be effective in reducing uh, pedestrian crash risk or crash problems, we also know that we can't solve all pedestrian crash problems with roadway and engineering treatments alone. That we also need to be aware that we need to work with other stakeholders and partners like educators, like public health officials, uh, to make sure that there is proper education for kids in the schools, for pedestrians of other ages, for drivers. Uh, here's an example in the next slide of a series of um, educational posters that have been used in Miami-Dade County to help educate uh, transit riders. These are big posters that are put in transit vehicles, buses, and trains to help uh, remind pedestrians of how to cross streets safely at night or at intersections or how to use the uh, uh, bus uh, safely and properly so that they can you know, ride the bus with uh, less risk of, of falling and uh, getting on and off the bus, uh, crossing at night, and how to make themselves more visible. And so uh, educational programs like this are an important ingredient in helping pedestrians to cross safely at unsignalized crossings. And the other ingredient, uh, well, here's an example of um, some educational messages aimed at senior pedestrians, the one on the left uh, called Walking Through the Years, uh, developed by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And the one on the right uh, was intended for a Hispanic population. It was done in, in Spanish. And there are other educational programs that have other uh, languages, uh, depending on the, the neighborhoods, uh, the ethnic neighborhoods there. And of course, the other ingredient that we will mention is that it's important to sometimes you know, use uh, enforcement, uh, selective enforcement. So drivers are given warnings or tickets when they speed, run red lights, or fail to yield to pedestrians in legal crosswalks. So if we can keep all these different countermeasure options in mind, think about all the different uh, uh, ways that pedestrians cross and the factors that can uh, not only cause increased crash risk, but can be the, the uh, countermeasures that can be used to improve safety, then uh, we can really 
uh, improve the walking environment for pedestrians. So, Davian, uh, at this point, I, th I think Peter and I would be open for questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Charlie, for your presentation. Um, I am going to launch a quick poll um, to the audience. Could you please tell us how many particip participants are at your site? Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for answering that poll question. And Charlie, before we get into questions, um, I am going to tell everyone a little bit about our next webinar. The next webinar in the Designing for Pedestrian Safety series is scheduled for September 9, 2010 at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. This webinar is entitled Intersection Geometry and will be presented by John LaPlante, LaPlante Director of Traffic Engineering at TY Land International and Keith Sinclair. Acting Assistant D Division Administrator uh, at the Federal Highway Administration Connecticut Division. Please visit www.walkinginfo.org forward slash webinars to register for this webinar and future ones in the Designer for Pedestrian Safety series. And once again, we do want to um, apologize for the audio issues we had at the beginning. Uh, at this time, we'll go ahead and get into questions. Um, our first question is, it seems that as a matter of standard practice, pedestrian crossings are striped at intersections. This seems more dangerous for pedestrians than crossing at mid-block locations. Why are there so few mid-block pedestrian crossings? Okay, uh, let me start on that, and Peter, you can add if you want to. Um, you know, generally, where you do see a marked crosswalk, it's going to be at an intersection. And we know that it, the laws in most states say that the extension of the sidewalks from one side of the street to the other is a legal crosswalk, whether it's marked or not. So there would be some logic in just going ahead and marking the crosswalk, uh, just as a reminder to motorists that, you know, to expect pedestrians and to uh, 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 show pedestrians where is a preferred crossing location. Now, there are some mid-block crossings, but like the question said, uh, it's, they're much, much less frequent than you find at intersections. And an, a mid-block crossing is not a legal crosswalk unless it's marked. Do you all hear that? If you're at a mid-block, it's not a legal crossing unless it's marked uh, with a crosswalk. So, um, and, and the safety of the crosswalk, whether it's mid-block or intersection, again, uh, depends on factors like the number of lanes, the vehicle speed, and the uh, uh, vehicle volume. Those are really three of the, the biggest factors. Of course, sight distance is also important. Um, so those are things to keep in mind. Uh, and there are mid-block crossings that are uh, appropriate that I've seen. Uh, but we, we do need to be careful uh, before we just mark a mid-block crosswalk so that, that, that we really have a, uh, a safe uh, features for the pedestrian to get across the street. Now, Peter, if you want to add to, uh, to that. No, um, I think you're right on. Uh, I guess one of the other things, though, is that you know, a study at a mid-block uh, en engineering study um, should be performed. Uh, to make sure that um, you know it is uh, one that meets the the different criteria with regards to what we've uh, discussed earlier with regards to the latest studies, so um, there is a little more uh, research involved or a little more um, work involved with doing a mid block. But I think maybe what the the person may be getting at is you know there's a lot of people who may want to cross. Um, there's a lot of crossings going on. How come we don't put more in? Um, and you know every situation, as you showed, there are some locations that. Uh, you know, is appropriate in other places that are, are, are not. So. Exactly. Okay, Davian. All righty, thank you. Um, our next question is, how can blind pedestrians be safely accommodated at unsignalized intersections, particularly at multi-lane roundabout crossings? All right, Peter, you want to take this one? Well, um, that's interesting. We just had a webinar uh, yesterday with um, uh, Tamara Redmond had done a, a webinar with the Access Board, and they were discussing uh, just this. And it is um, a situation where they're looking at uh, maybe putting in uh, some type of, whether the rectangular rapid flash or the hawk, um, but at multi-lane roundabouts, uh, that is a, a difficult situation, a little more difficult this situation for the blind. And so they are looking at trying to um, figure out some countermeasures to, to assist them across that situation. Um, yeah, I was going to say one of the other crossings that they uh, uh, tested was a, a raised crosswalk. And uh, as Peter said, it's the multi-lane roundabouts where pedestrians, especially visually impaired, have, have the most challenges and issues, and where, where there needs to be some, uh, perhaps some other measures like the hawk signal 
uh, you know, to, to assist uh, visually impaired pedestrians. Okay, I will move on to our next question. Is grade separation a good strategy for pedestrian safety? Did you say is a good strategy? Yes. It depends. Uh, like I said, it depends on the situation. Uh, I showed some examples where it is a reasonable strategy, you know, where you have pedestrians that need to cross a freeway, like where a freeway has split a neighborhood or, or something. Uh, there's one actually in Chapel Hill, where I live here on uh, campus at UN University of North Carolina, where they have an overpass across Manning Drive, that where you, if you park your car in the parking deck on one side of Manning, then all you have to do is walk uh, at this, you know, second level across the overpass, so you don't have to go all the way down the steps or down the elevator, then cross a, a busy four-lane road, and then uh, back up some steps and back up the hill. It's much more convenient to use the overpass. So it, it's an overpass that's appropriate, it's well used by people that you know, park in the deck, uh, and it uh, reduces their chance of being struck, you know, crossing Manning Drive. But there are many situations where uh, an overpass is not appropriate or, or necessary. Uh, for example, on two-lane roads or fairly uh, moderate to lower speed, uh, lower volume roads. So you really have to, uh, you know, uh, I recommend that you consider other uh, crossing treatments or other measures before you go ahead and uh, commit to spending, you know, that much money on an overpass or underpass. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to our next question. There are guidelines for the distance between a mid-block crossing and a traffic signal. Is there a desired minimum distance between uncontrolled mid-block crossings? Is there a recommended distance between uncontrolled mid-block crossings? Uh, nothing that I've seen in the, in the guidelines. Um, and I think that really depends on the conditions. You know, some cities have really short block lengths, and other cities have really long block lengths. So I think uh, I, I can't give you an exact distance away but what I would say is, again, go out to the site, observe where people are crossing the street, uh, and that should sort of give you some hints as to, you know, where it might be appropriate to uh, consider some kind of unsignalized crossing treatment. You know, and uh, obviously you don't want, you know, two crosswalks too close together. Uh, you know, you don't want them 50 feet or 100 feet apart. Uh, but do go look at the origins and destinations and um, consider the uh, conditions of the roadway, how many lanes is it, what's the volume, what's the speed, what's the sight distance, and then sort of make a decision there. And again, just remember that um, just because you go and put two lines across the street, you paint a crosswalk, that in itself is not going to necessarily reduce pedestrian crash risk, according to our research. Again, let me say that again. Just the marked crosswalk alone is not going to reduce crash risk. So if you are going to use uh, a mid-block crossing, Depending on the, the width of the road and the volume, et cetera, you may want to also consider something like a little mid-block crossing island, kind of like we showed there, uh, you know, uh, where, where the lighting uh, was used in conjunction with people crossing from an apartment to the bus stop. So just think about other enhancements uh, when you think about mid-block crossings or intersection crossings besides just uh, crosswalks alone. Okay, our next question asks, do advanced yield lines and yield shear signs improve safety at high volume multi-lane marked crosswalks? Okay, let me, let me tell you what I think we know about that and maybe what we don't know yet about that. Uh, most of the, the research I've seen, um, Ron Van Houten has done some of the uh, research on that, and he has used uh, the rectangular rapid flash beacon on multi-lane roads with uh, traffic volumes up to about 25,000, maybe 30,000. Um, and while there are not enough sites that were used in that study, and maybe we don't have enough sites yet to do a crash-based analysis, the uh, conflict analysis he did did indicate that conflicts were reduced, that motorist yielding behavior went increased dramatically up to as high as 90 percent or even a little bit more. So if we can at least use that as a basis for uh, saying, well, that there seems to be certainly more vehicles stopping and yielding for pedestrians. Uh, I think that's a good sign, but two things to, to remember. Number one is we still don't have a comprehensive crash-based study on that device yet, and hopefully we will in a few years as more and more of these are put in and somebody will have a large enough sample size. Um, and the second thing is um, 
even talking to Dr. Van Houten about that, he doesn't necessarily recommend using the, the rectangular rapid flash beacon for the really high volume, you know, the 35, 40,000 uh, vehicles a day. Uh, under those kinds of conditions, it might be more appropriate to think about, uh, you know, the uh, pedestrian beacon, you know, the hawk signal, or even whether full signalization is, uh, is warranted. Yeah, hey, Davian, um, can you read the question again? I was wondering if, um, was that with regards to the rectangular rapid flash or advanced uh, stop bar? I... Um, the question didn't say. Uh, if that uh, attendee wants to uh, specify uh, which they were referring to, we can um, clear that question up. Okay. No, and, and Charlie is absolutely correct. Uh, I guess in addition, I thought for some reason I, th I heard advanced uh, stop. Yeah, I'm, I'm call. sorry. I, I, okay. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Just for the advanced stop line is, is um, if you're going to have a marked crosswalk across a multi-lane road, then certainly, you know, there are some reasons for putting in the advanced uh, yield line or stop line with a sign. I'm sorry, I also went into the rectangular rapid flash beacon, but that's sort of the next step up, and then the next step up above that is the uh, hawk signal. So it's kind of, I guess I see that as kind of a series uh, uh, of possible options that you could use depending on the number of lanes and the traffic volume and speed. Okay. Um, and this is a quick question, Charlie. Uh, when you refer to speeds in the presentation, are you referring to the posted speed or the 85th percentile speed? Um, well, you know, most of what we talked about is just speeds in general. Um, and, um, you know, certainly we use 85th percentile speeds in uh, some of our uh, decisions. Uh, in this particular study that I did that I reported on, the one on the Mark versus Unmark Crosswalk Study, we actually used speed limit. Uh, that was the, the variable that we had available, and I realized speed limit is not always perfectly matched with 85th percentile speed. But it just depends on what you're, refer you're referring to, if you're talking about the research we did or uh, some of the other uh, issues there. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question asks, how about freeway on-ramp and off-ramp crosswalks? Um, are these considered unsignalized uh, pedestrian crossings? Okay, uh, well, it depends. I mean, in, in one of the later sections that uh, is presented as part of this webinar series on interchanges, that will get into a lot of detail on um, on-ramps and, uh, and off-ramps and some of the different, uh, you know, crossing measures. So, you know, it, it, the answer is it depends on the type of intersection that's used there. And um, you know, we have the, uh, you know, what we call the spewies, the single point urban interchange. We have diamond, we have clover leaves, we have uh, double crossover diamonds. We have different kinds of intersection designs. And depending on the type of, inter I'm sorry, interchange designs, depending on the type of interchange, uh, you know, the, the ramps may be governed or controlled by only crosswalks. Uh, some ramps may be controlled by signals. Uh, unfortunately, many of our interchanges in some urban areas don't have any control um, and they don't have any sidewalks or walkways. So, um, you know, we do need to be considering pedestrian travel on some of these uh, interchanges, uh, particularly where they uh, do conflict with the on-ramps or off-ramps. Okay, the next question asks, has consideration been given to different types of lighting and its impact on crosswalk visibility? Uh, for instance, HPS versus LED. Hey, Peter, do you want to touch that one? or? Um, well, you know, I'm not a lighting expert, but uh, it, in that report that I provided the link for, it does go into some of the different types of lights, uh, such as low sodium and such. Uh, I'm not sure if it talks about the LED. Um, However, uh, you know, the best person um, or the best uh, people to probably discuss with is uh, maybe at a DOT where they do have specialists in that area. Um, also, isn't there, a, Charlie, there's a group out there which um, that deals with lighting, correct? I'm, that organization is, I'm blanking out on right now, but maybe if somebody... Um, yeah, what, what we'll do, Peter, let's, uh, maybe we can um, put a link up to some of that, that documentation. I mean, there, there's a lot of good technical information and uh, guidelines on lighting that, um, um, you know, could be beneficial for pedestrians. Uh, but we don't, you know, you know, like Peter said, we're not lighting experts, and, and we don't want to tell you something uh, 
unless we, we can really you know, give you the link and with some of the details. So maybe that'll be something that we'll provide in terms of a link. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, the next question asks, what about sign pollution? Um, too many signs, ads, polls, et cetera, getting in the way of sign visibility. I mean, sure, that, that can be a problem. Um, again, from a traffic engineering standpoint, um, you know, signs can be overused. Or uh, I've seen cases where, you know, signs are blocked by other signs or by, you know, tree branches. And so we really need to be thinking about, you know, what a, what a driver is able to uh, uh, handle in terms of, you know, the environment. Your drivers have many different uh, issues to deal with as they're driving along the roadway. And uh, too many signs can be a distraction, uh, as well as not the proper signing or not not the right sign. You know, some of the some of the recent things with uh, these LED billboards, that's been a controversy around here lately. And uh, you know there are questions about, you know, do you want big billboards with you know, lots of messages that are going to distract drivers from their, their driving driving task? I mean, we have enough trouble with uh, <laughs> drivers being distracted with cell phones and text messaging that we're still dealing with, and maybe will for a long time. But, but you're right with the, the uh, overuse of signing in the environment. That's something that we can control. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question asks: Can the R1-6 be installed at the right curb at a painted yield bar? At a painted yield bar. Um, Painted there, yield. Uh, yeah, uh, I think we're t you're talking about the uh, yield here to the pedestrian the, sign. The the in street uh, pedestrian crossing sign that hey, the not over sign. Um, Typically, I haven't seen that application um, on the right, but it, it doesn't uh, necessarily state that they can. Typically, we see that application in the median, where there is somewhat of a wide median um, to notify pedestrians on both sides of the roadway for. Uh, um, to yield or to stop. Um, however, it doesn't state that you can't necessarily um, put a, a, a sign of that nature. I have seen some states actually put that sign um, uh, as a, I guess, even under a stop bar at, or a stop sign, which doesn't quite make sense to me. But uh, um, it's just a, a, another reminder that vehicles do have to stop or yield to pedestrians. And the, I, I can give the reference with regards to that, um, the R1-6. It's in Section 2B-12 uh, of the METCD. OK. We'll move on to our next question. Um, the next question asks, can the in-street signs be mounted in a more permanent manner on a sign, um, it says most, I think it's a sign post with a seven-foot clearance above ground? If so, should the size be larger? It seems that the greater mounting height would be more visible on high volume um, and high speed roads. Well, the METCD does specify the, uh, the sign height and the, the sign size, but I would just add, instead of you know, considering a, a larger sign in that situation, if you're on a higher speed multi-lane road, is I, I'm not, um, I wouldn't recommend that, that that sign be the one that's used. I don't think we have enough research to really show us uh, definitely what are the conditions, whether that sign is appropriate. But just based on some of our own research, I think there are some uh, concerns about um, you know, how, how well that sign is followed. And so uh, if, if you're wanting to provide an uh, unsignalized mid-block crossing, for example, I think there are definitely better options available than to try to just enlarge that sign and, and raise the uh, the height of the sign, like the rectangular rapid flash beacon or the, the hawk signal. OK. Uh, the next um, question. Oh, Debbie, oh, go ahead. I apologize. Uh, I need to retract my uh, comment earlier on the uh, in, in street sign. I actually just went to the METCD, and it does state the in street pedestrian crossing sign shall not be post mounted on the left hand or right hand side of the roadway. So it is um, basically um, on the center line um, in the roadway. That's where it should be used. Thank you, Peter. Um, the next question we have asks, are yield line markings only for mid-block locations? Um, 
the UMTCD examples are for mid broad crosswalks, they say. Well, I've seen them used at intersections. Uh, but again, it, it depends on the situation that you have. I mean, you have to be, you know, take into account, you know, where you want vehicles to stop. And there may, may be some issues about you know, blocking driveways or blocking side streets. Uh, so it just it depends on the situation. But, but, I, but I certainly have seen them used at intersections. Okay. All right. And it looks like we have time for a few more questions. Uh, the next question asks, if you are a yield state, should you still put stop signs on greenway, greenway trails at uh, for pedestrians, or does that send a conflicted messages conflicted message between pedestrians and vehicles? <clears throat> okay, I, you know, I'm trying to understand the question. Are they saying should you put stop signs on the trail side for bicyclists and pedestrians, or on the roadway side? Or um, it just says on greenway trails. Um, it does not say which side. Let's see if we can get some clear. If we could get some clarification, we can get to that question. Um, do you want to go ahead and try to take a stab at that, Charlie, or do you want us to? Um, we can skip that one and try to come back to it later. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to. If it sounds like they're probably asking about the uh, stop sign on the trail side, you know, of course that that would be appropriate, uh, depending on the the volume of uh, pedestrians and bicycles on the trail on the roadway side. Um, pro probably would not be the best application um, you know, from a couple of standpoints. Number one, uh, and again, I'm trying to visualize uh, the situation that, that they may be referring to. But if you're on a, a you know fairly moderate to high volume roadway, um, I don't think it would normally be the best solution to just put in a stop sign. So I think there are certainly um, more desirable treatments that, that would be used for the motor vehicle approaches at a trail crossing than, than a stop sign. Okay. Um, we have another question that asks, uh, do you have any experience with crash barriers at pedestrian refu refuge islands? Are they more of a hazard than a help? You said crash barriers? Uh, crash barriers at pedestrian refuge islands. Okay, when he says barriers, I'm not sure what he means exactly by that. Um, whether he's talking about like a concrete barrier or I'm not clear about sort of the application. I mean, I, I think certainly um, it's appropriate to make sure that the uh, median island is very visible and that may take the form of uh, you know, signing or uh, uh, other, you know, very visible paint or other devices just to make sure the, the motor sees the the, uh, uh, the curbing. But um, again, every situation is different. I'm, if they're talking about having a concrete barrier there, uh, that in, generally I would not think that would be a, a good idea. I mean, obviously we want to try to keep in mind the safety of the motorist as well as pedestrians. So. Uh, generally, a raised barrier curb is what we would want to make it very visible, possibly with signing uh, on the nose of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, island. Okay. Um, the next question asks: How can accessibility be maintained with safe crossing opportunities, such as the continuous median? Should these include marked crossings with ramps? at a certain interval. Okay, Peter, on the accessibility issue, you want to start on that one? Yeah, what was the last, I'm sorry, the last part of that question, I didn't quite catch that. Sure, it says, should these include marked crossings with ramps at a certain, certain interval? Yeah, if, uh, well, if you want to make a legalized crossing, um, you do need to make it accessible. So if you've done an engineering study, and you've uh, picked a mid-block crossing, um, and you do have a, a raised median there, it does need to be accessible. Any time you make a um, accessible to a pedestrian, a legalized crosswalk, it has to be accessible for ADA. So um, truncated domes, uh, the proper curb ramps, um, that all needs to go in. Um, now, if they're referring to just having 
um, a raised median, a continuous raised median, where they haven't marked it, um, then no, that doesn't need to be accessible because you're not making that necessarily accessible to everyone. You're not le legally stating that uh, that's a marked crosswalk. So hopefully that uh, addresses the question. Okay. Um, and we're going to take a couple more questions. Are there guidelines for conditions that would warrant a crosswalk at an uncontrolled location, location such as number of pedestrian crossings, vehicle speed, vehicle volume, roadway width, distance to nearest controlled crosswalk? All right. Well, let me try to answer that. We actually um, came up with some recommended uh, guidelines, not only the ones that we read and that are now part of the METCD on when you don't want to use marked crosswalks alone, but we also had just some general recommendations on uh, conditions that would deserve to have a marked crosswalk. In other words, we know on a lot of our local streets, you know, some cities have hundreds and hundreds of miles of local streets uh, with very low speed, very low volume, and, uh, you know, it can be very expensive to put a cro marked crosswalk on every single intersection on every local street in the city. We're not recommending that. In fact, so we came up with some sort of minimum pedestrian volumes that we'd recommend uh, that might be suitable to, to justify spending the money on, you know, installing the marked crosswalk and, and maintaining them. Because once you install the marked crosswalk, you know, you want to make sure that they're visible and, and, and well maintained like we talked about. Um, but, you know, the METCD is, uh, doesn't say you absolutely must have a crosswalk under these conditions at unsignalized locations. That is left up to the judgment of the engineer or planner. Um, I would add that you know, we, we haven't really talked much about signalized intersections. Um, and while you're not required to put in marked crosswalks at signalized intersections, I can't think of any reason why you wouldn't. I mean, if, if, if uh, a traffic signal is warranted, uh, particularly you know, with walk, don't walk signals, why wouldn't you put in a marked crosswalk? You know, so that, that's an issue that I would also say. And, and certainly we have criteria and, uh, uh, in school zones for putting in marked crosswalks. And there, there are certainly needs to uh, uh, indicate to the children where is a preferred crossing location for them to cross the street. OK, and we're going to take one last question. Um, again, if we didn't get to your question, we will address the, um, all questions submitted and post those to the website. And once again, that website is www.walkinginfo.org forward slash webinars. We will also be posting this presentation along with the slides and transcription. The last question asks, does a marked crosswalk change priority between pedestrians and motorists? That is, do motorists have right of way if no crossing is marked, while pedestrians have right of way if a crossing is marked? And in general, how is a motorist supposed to know when they are obligated to yield to a pedestrian? OK, well, this gets back to the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, laws in each state. And, uh, you know, when we take the driver's test to get our driver's license or get our license renewed, you know, there are certain things we, we need to know and, and uh, to go along with the, the laws in our state. Um, and essentially it says that, you know, if there's a legal crosswalk, the motorist, file, in, in most every state, the wording is a little different, but it, essentially if you're, if you're a motorist and you're crossing in a legal crosswalk, whether it's marked or not, then by law you're required to yield the right of way to pedestrians. And generally along with that law, pedestrians have an obligation too, and that is, you know, to, um, you know, to cross streets, you know, at legal crossings, or if it's not a legal crossing, you know, pedestrians need to yield uh, to motorists. In other words, if some, somebody's crossing mid-block, um, pedestrians need to, to, you know, yield to oncoming traffic. So, so essentially, you know, and I think I understand the, the essence of what they're saying is, well, how's the driver to know where there's a legal crossing. Well, the, you know, it's not always easy to tell. I realize that. But uh, whenever motorists come upon an intersection, and again, the laws vary a little bit, but where there's, there's sidewalks and where there's, um, uh, you know, pedestrians in the area, pedestrian, uh, drivers are supposed to yield to pedestrians. And, you know, th then there are other aspects of the law. For example, a, a motorist is not supposed to pass uh, a vehicle that's going in the same direction if that first vehicle is stopping to yield to a pedestrian. So those are just some of the you know, uh, general requirements and uh, responsibilities that we have as drivers and pedestrians. So Peter, do you want to add anything to that? Nope, I think you covered it. Okay. Okay, well, uh, 
I know we've got to wrap up, but thank you all so much, and we really appreciate everyone tuning in for the webinar. And uh, like Davian said, we'll try to answer other questions uh, that we didn't have time to cover today. And look forward to uh, you all joining us for the next uh, webinar. So, and thanks for to Peter Run for for joining us too. I really appreciate that. So, Davian, you want to close things off? Yes. Thank you, Charlie. Um, thank you, Charlie and Peter, both for today's presentation. Um, the PBIC and today's webinar are both made possible with funding from the U.S. Department of Transportation Federal Highway Administration. Uh, once again, today's session will be archived and available for download on our website at www.walkinginfo.org forward slash webinars. Uh, finally, I want to remind everyone that a brief survey will appear once the webinar has ended. Again, we very uh, much appreciate you taking a moment to complete it. Uh, thank you again to our speaker, Charlie, and also for, um, to Peter Unn for joining us. And thanks to all of you for attending today's PBIC and Federal Highway Administration Designing for Pedestrian Safety webinar. Thank you and have a great day.